This is the video for pre-lecture 12. Having completed our analysis of initial value problems, we're transitioning to boundary value problems. And core to this is the analysis or the evaluation of spatial derivatives. So, so far, the focus has been all on solving those initial value problems with an initial condition. And we had three time marching schemes. Those were our Euler methods, explicit and implicit, our RK methods, as well as our Craig Nicholson method. Spatial variations differs because the boundary conditions are not generally all at one location and may not have values for each of the different differential levels. So for instance, if we're evaluating the temperature between two ends, we could say, well, our temperature at one end is phi is equal to zero, the temperature at the other end is phi is equal to one. This would be probably solving something like our heat equation, and if we assume it's just a steady state heat equation, then our equation is going to just be d squared phi dx squared is equal to zero. Or maybe it could be equal to some source term that's a function of space only. Well, we now have two boundary conditions, so we have a sufficient number of conditions to solve the problem, but we have no information about what's going on with d phi dx, for instance. So you could produce a, a shooting method where you're estimating d phi dx, propagate from one edge to the other, update. But the other option is to solve the boundary value problem simultaneously. So this would be saying, okay, we have approximate values of our temperature at a discrete set of points, and we want to come up with values phi1, phi2, phi3, phi4, and phi5, such that they approximately satisfy our governing equations and our boundary conditions. So initial value problems are solved with time marching, which took one step and advanced it to the next stage. Boundary value problems will solve for the entire space simultaneously. And to solve simultaneously, we need a set of equations for each spatial position and solve now a system of equations. So this requires us to implement the numerical method, finite difference, to take derivatives. And we'll be focusing today on just taking derivatives. So finite difference. Finite difference is an approximation of a derivative using values at discrete points, which are themselves a finite distance away from each other. So going back to that number line, Let's say we have discrete temperature values at these various locations. And we're going to just go ahead and say this is our phi i position, and maybe a phi i plus 1, and a phi i minus 1. Well, let's say we want to approximate either the first or the second derivative at our phi i position. Well, what we need to do for our finite difference approximation is say, okay, we're going to approximate d phi dx as being some function of phi i and its neighbors. If the neighbors are all on one side, so phi i plus 1, phi i plus 2, so on and so forth, or alternatively, phi i, phi i minus 1, phi i minus 2, so on and so forth. These would both be sided approximations. So, for instance, the phi i, phi i plus 1, phi i plus 2, those are, that's a forward approximation because we're taking the information at our current position where we're wanting to make the approximation, and the pluses are all to the forward side, and the minuses would all be to the backward side. Alternatively, we could have an approximation f, which takes into account information from both sides. So it could account for just phi i, phi i plus 1, and phi i minus 1. This would be an example of a central or a centered approximation. So how do we determine what the function is that relates phi i, phi i plus 1, phi i minus 1, so on and so forth, to a derivative? Well, we're going to use our Taylor expansion. So what we saw last time for an Euler method is that we could rearrange these terms to come up with an approximation for d phi dt. And so just as a reminder, that was something to the effect of d phi dx was equal to 
phi of, in this case we're going to just use x plus delta x, minus phi of x divided by the quantity delta x minus one half delta x d squared phi dx squared minus a number of other terms minus one over n factorial times delta x n minus one dn phi dx. So all I've done is I've rearranged my equation to isolate the derivative that we're trying to approximate in this case would be d phi dx and we have a number of terms on the right hand side and so what we would say is that all of these terms containing derivative approximations we're going to approximate these as order delta x because again the leading order term the term with the fewest number of dx's whether it be dx dx squared dx cubed is this term here with a delta x. And so that's going to give us information on what the truncation error is for that finite difference approximation. Okay? So this is an example where we could say maybe this is phi i plus 1 minus phi i divided by delta x is our approximation, and this is accurate to order delta x truncation error. Well, let's take a look at our centered approximation. So again, thinking about trying to come up with an approximation for d phi dx, we're going to now take two Taylor expansions, the expansion for phi at x plus delta x and phi at x minus delta x. So I've written out the first couple terms for that. And we want to make approximations for d phi dx. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just identify which of the derivatives do we want to keep, or perhaps I should say isolate? So we want to isolate the derivative that we're trying to approximate. So in this case, we're going to try to approximate d phi dx. Okay. And we're going to approximate that with two Taylor expansions, one for phi i plus 1 and one for phi i minus 1. So we have these two Taylor expansions. There's no need for a Taylor expansion about phi i itself. That's sort of contained here on the right hand side. So this is our phi i term. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, starting from the leftmost side, we're going to box every other term, or we're going to create the same number of boxes as we have Taylor expansions that we're considering. So in this case we have two Taylor expansions we're considering. So we're going to make two boxes. Our first box for, for our first derivative is going to be one that we isolate or keep. The other type of box that we're going to create is a red box corresponding to terms that we want to eliminate. Okay. And so what's going to happen is we're, for this very simple case, we're simply going to take the difference between our two Taylor expansions. So we're going to subtract our second equation. That plus becomes a minus, this plus becomes a minus, and this minus becomes a plus. And just simply combine these two Taylor expansions. And so that's going to leave us with phi i plus 1 minus phi i minus 1 is equal to our two phi i terms cancel each other. Next we have 2 times delta x times d phi dx. Our next terms also perfectly balance and can cancel each other, meaning that it's going to give us a zero. And then finally, we have one third delta x cubed, d cubed phi dx cubed. And so now we can rearrange our equation to isolate our d phi dx term and give us the following. d phi dx is equal to phi i plus 1 minus phi i minus 1 divided by 2 delta x minus 1 over 6 delta x squared d cubed phi dx cubed. 
So we would say that this truncation error is plus order delta x squared, and that this approximation, phi i plus 1 minus phi i minus 1 divided by 2 delta x, is our approximation for d phi dx. And this sort of makes sense, actually. So if we think about just sort of a, a typical line, and we want to say, okay, we're going to do an approximation for our slope at this point, and we're going to use information here and here. Well, we're going to just take the difference between these two values and do sort of a rise over a run. So the difference here would be phi i plus 1 minus phi i minus 1. And the difference distance horizontally between these two would be 2 delta x. So graphically, that sort of makes sense for our approximation. So let's go ahead and do an example. So if we were trying to approximate the derivative of our function, v of x is equal to x cubed at our position x equals to 1. Well, we could do this analytically, right? So we know that, okay, dv dx is equal to 3x squared. And so our approximation at uh, dv dx at x equals to 1 is just 3. Well, what if we want to do our finite difference approximation? So if we use a sided approximation, we could say, okay, well, let's evaluate v at, let's say, just 1 plus a delta x value of 0 0.1 minus v at 1 divided by our delta x value of 0 0.1. So that would be 1.1 cubed minus 1 would be equal to 1.331 minus 1 divided by 0 0.1 is equal to 3.31. So that's our approximation. So not too bad, about 10% off of the actual value. But if we improve our result by decreasing our delta x, so let's say it's 0 0.01 minus v1, well, this is going to give us a value of 1.0301 minus 1 divided by 0 0.01. So this should be 30. That gives us a value of 3.03. Okay. And so what we see is that our error has gone from a value of 0.3 now to a value of 0 0.03. Well, what if we did this for our center? So it would be like phi at 1 plus 0 0.1 minus phi at 1 minus 0 0.1 divided by 2 times 0 0.1. Well, you could plug these values in, so you'd have 1.1 cubed minus 0 0.9 cubed, and it could be shown that this is going to give you a value of 3.01. And if we increase our precision, divided by 2 times 0 0.01, we would get a value of 3.0001. And so we can even see here that the center approximation not only gives us a more accurate result for the same step size, but we're seeing our error, epsilon, go down by a factor of 10 as we cut our time, our spatial step by a factor of 10, but for our centered approximation, our error goes down by a factor of 100 when we only decrease our resolution by a factor of 10. Okay, so we'll do some more examples and code some of this up.